Awesome. So I'm Joanna Whitrack. I support um, all 32 elementary schools, our social workers within those schools um, as like a social work coach. Janie, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Janie Keister, and I uh, work in the Transition Education Program. So we implement the McKinney Vental Homeless Assistance Act, which is a federal law supporting students, youth, and families experiencing homelessness in the public schools. Awesome. So we did put together a little slideshow today. Can I share my screen? You should be able to. Yes. This is the the, the point of, you know, this is where we always worry. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, you know what? It lets me, but it won't let me do the actual one. Let me see if I still. This is only our like 3,832nd <laughs> Zoom meeting, but you never know. That might be the one where we have. That happens. It's always like yeah. in the moment. You're like, oh, no. Is it, <laughs> it is always in the moment. It's You test it out beforehand and, oh, it worked great. But <laughs> Dorina, right, do you want me to share? Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay. Actually, yeah, you know what, now, Danny, We can see well, your notes no, as can. well, just FYI. So. I can. I have two fine. screens, Joanna. That would. Oh, actually, yeah, that would be great then, if you don't mind. Yeah, let me let me share. So a little prefacing, um, we weren't quite exactly sure what you were, guys were looking for. So we're hoping for questions. Feel free to um, feel free to interrupt us at any time. What as we go through the slideshow, we kind of went through who we are as students, um, who our staff is what social workers do in the school. And then I put in a really real slide of what my daily life as a building-based social worker was every single day. Um, so if that's not what you guys are looking for, please feel free to stop us um, and ask questions that would be more relevant to, to what you are looking for. No, that's, this is perfect. Exactly what we're looking for. Thank you, Joanna. Awesome, great. And you okay. can see the slides okay? Yeah. We can see it great, thank you. You wanna advance, Jan, Jamie? Okay, so who are we? Um, in Madison Metropolitan School District, we have 52 schools, 32 are elementary schools, um, which I support school social workers. Um, my counterpart, Laura, who unfortunately is, cannot be with us today, um, supports the 12 middle schools and six high schools. Um, the total number of students are 25,000 plus. Um, and we have, this number is questionable. I found it on DPI's website. 45.6% um, of students were reported as being economically disadvantaged. That was um, the la latest data that they were reporting was as, as of the 1920 school year. So it is fairly old. Um, and like Jenny and I both paused and were like, really? Do you, you know, so, so that was, that seemed a little bit low to us. Um, but we are reporting what DPI reported. Um, Jenny, you want to talk about the TEP students? Yeah, so um, we look at our data as, uh, not as frequently as we probably should, but on the 16th of January, we had identified 1,050 students who have been identified as homeless throughout this whole school year, starting in uh, September. 965 of them are still active with us. So we've lost about a hundred um, uh, students through mobility and housing and all kinds of things. But currently there's um, about a thousand of them still in seats in our district. Yeah. Um, so of those 25,000 plus students, they um, the diversity ranges 18% African-American students, 8% Asian students, 24% um, 24, 24 Latino, 40% white and 10% have identified themselves as two or more races. And when we look at um, diversity among our uh, TEP students, it's about 80 to 85% students of color. So when you think about um, that percentage in the homeless population, it is just there's a lot more kids of color who are experiencing homelessness than kids who are not. I would say the same for the students who receive special education services too, correct, Jenny? Yes. Yeah. So um, of the total student body, 26% um, 20, are ELL, so English language learners, um, and then 15% are students who receive special education services. That and is those... kind of... Oops, go ahead. Go ahead. Nope. Nope. <laughs> that is who we serve. Um, and just kind of to give you guys a snapshot of what daily life in MMSD looks like for our students. Yeah, and those two uh, populations, ELL and um, 
special ed students are also very highly uh, represented in our populations. And I will say that newcomers is a very much a population that is uh, expanding in our TEP number. So uh, families that are new to us from other countries, newcomers is uh, the term. And we've seen a, I feel like a big rise in that within the last year, year and a half. Um, so we're having to like shift and flex um, how we support um, based, based on a lot of newcomers. Mm -hmm. Jan, you want to go on? Um, I just moved to the next slide. Oh, sorry. I didn't even see. Um, okay. So who are we? Um, our staff. So we, MMSD has 70 plus social workers that support 52 schools um, and district-wide support. So that would include like me and my counterpart, part, Laura. We're still considered social workers, but we um, don't actually go to a school day today. We work in the district office, although we're often in many of the schools. Um, each school's allocation, so um, how much social work time they get, um, ranges from 0.4, which we only have one elementary school that has 0.4. Um, most of them have 0.5, so that would be like two and a half days a week, um, or up to 3.0, so that would be three whole people, and that would be the high schools um, based on numbers. Um, and then all of the allocation is a formula based on like size, demographics, um, you know, uh, percent of step TEP students, habitual truancy rates, those kind of things. It's all in like this little formula that comes up with this number. Um, and then we fit the people within those numbers. So those are just social workers um, in the schools, but I wanted to highlight that we very closely work with our student services teams. So that would be like our nurse, our, our nurses that are in buildings, our psychologists, our counselors, um, PBS coaches, which is po positive behavior um, supports. Jenny, am I missing anybody? You know, um, yeah. I guess the, the point is it takes a village, right? We can't do what we do to support families without um, having a team around us and having people who might have a different connection with this other family, even though it might be a more social worky kind of like um, point. If my psychologist has a really good, good relationship with that family, I'll communicate with her so she can communicate with with them, right? So it's not like all of these people in, in inundating a family um, when they're already stressed. I would add that in the TEP world, there's two of us. There's uh, my counterpart, Shannon, and myself. I typically uh, focus on elementary, younger, sort of the community connections and the shelter connections. And Shannon uh, does a lot of support for secondary and our unaccompanied youth and has a connection to the Briar Patch shelter because that's youth connected. So um, out of all those uh, support pieces, there's two of us that do the TEP work in Madison. All right, so this is a, it's a very wordy slide and I typically don't do that, um, but I wasn't sure of your guys' familiarity with what school social workers do. Um, so this is straight off the School Social Work Association's website. Um, well, I, I kind of tweaked a little bit, but um, so there are major pockets of kind of what a school social worker does day in, day out. And I always say like the frust most frustrating, but also the, the thing that made me love the job most is I would walk into school and have a list of stuff that I was going to do. And inevitably, like you would not get any of that done and you would have a million other things thrown at you that you would have to problem solve throughout the day. So on a, a typical day could be any of this, any of these things, um, but this list is not exhaustive. Um, I, I think the next slide that I have, don't go yet, is <laughs> maybe more real. Um, and it, it kind of puts me in a little bit of a vulnerable place as I was thinking about, you know, what to actually tell you guys. Um, but I would say from this slide, the most, the body, the biggest bodies of work are we support our students with what they need. We support our families with what they need. Um, we contribute to the school wide community in all of these different ways. So like IEPs, developing like alternative programs, a lot of behavioral work, um, and then providing like case manager services um, for families like throughout into the community. 
Um, and then we are really the bridge between school and community. How can we, uh, we need to know about the community support supports in, around, in and around us and be able to translate that into, in, in a way that families can understand and take advantage of while we're supporting those connections. And I would say in the world of TEP, um, I spend a lot of my time in those uh, community liaison positions. We monitor and pull together a resource list for our school social workers that uh, have all the different things that we've been asked for for help and support. You know, where to go do laundry, how to find transportation for parents, where is shelter, how do we get connected to housing resources, um, how do I help pay for bills, how is, do we get rent, and how do we help with evictions. So we have, um, we monitor and maintain a, a huge community resource list that um, we update as often as we possibly can and are constantly adding new things to it. Like just the other day, I added Sleep in Heavenly Peace, which is a um, organization that helps with beds for kids. So this, uh, you know, in the role of TEP, um, helping meet those basic needs is a real critical part of what we do so kids can be ready to go to school. So we spend a lot of time, or I spend a lot of time, um, maintaining those community resources and making sure that my fellow social workers and point of contacts in the schools have what they need to support uh, families. Mm -hmm. Does, actually, you want to go back to that, Jenny? Sure. I'm wondering if if we does do people have questions about this slide or something that doesn't make sense to you or do we want, do we want to save questions to the end what's best whatever works best for you does anyone have any questions right now we certainly have we'll have time at the <clears throat> excuse me the time at the end as well yeah claire there we go yeah claire i was wondering did um what's the history of the percentage time per counselor at schools has it ever been one counselor per school mm -hmm. Was it less? Like, mm -hmm. just kind of thinking about, you know, how resources have changed or maybe how we'd want to advocate for more resources. So are you asking specifically about counselors or social workers? Or... Sorry, social workers. Yeah, oh, that's okay. How you're no, saying, like, okay. you know, the 0.4 versus the you know, <laughs> three and, and all yeah. the, the different so, percentages. Um, I, I actually don't have a good handle on that. This is only my second year in this position. I'm supporting social workers. I know when I, so I was a building based social worker with a bunch of different allocations, kind of like part of my job was social work, part of it was PBS, part of it was Dean and, you know, special ed PST. So like my whole time, 15 years at Sandberg Elementary School was, I, I believe, 0.8 social work. So it seems pretty static. Um, we're pretty committed to not decreasing allocation um, to disrupt school, kind of, you know, like it would be hard to have a person who is 0.5 and then say, oh, no, you're 0.3. Um, so I, I don't have a great answer for what that looks like, but I, my sense would be pretty static with like maybe a 0.1 increase. Um, we did just recently increase allocation to high schools to better fit the um, the ratio, um, the recommended ratio um, for student to um, social work. Janet, do you have any insight in that? You've been there, been here longer than I have. I would say that sometimes a squeaky wheel gets more support. Um, and um, that doesn't mean that those that aren't squeaky don't need the support, but you hear about it more often from some um, school communities versus others. And like Joanna was saying, uh, the, the district is pretty aware that we are below uh, the recommended ratio for our support services. And there's a lot of advocacy going on right now to increase that so that we're at that recommended support system. Um, that said, it, that's uh, that cost money to do and time and people and you know the district's trying to make those hard decisions about where does it make sense to put the most support. We of course would allocate uh, advocate for lots more support and get that ratio in in. Uh, in line to where it needs to be. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Yeah. This this slide has a lot on it. So um, if you have other questions, please let us know. Yeah, well, actually, I have one question for either for Trent yeah. or Janet, for either of you. 
you know, a lot of this depends on other community partners, right? You mentioned other partners that you're working with. I mean, Jenny, you and I, we you know, worked together before. You know, how do you maintain those relationships? Um, you know, when you're, you know, you talked about Joanna, you walked right into school and then you're <laughs> dealing with whatever issues right in front of you that day, which is of course appropriate at the time, but that can be harder to build those relationships with those partners, you know, like groups like whoever, I'm just, Portside's on now, but you know, whoever, whoever those, those folks are to help. You know, Jenny, in, in your space with TEP, there's a lot of different partners that are sort of working on this. How do you build those relationships, maintain those relationships so that they're strong, so that there are the community partners out there that can help with the great work that you're doing? You want me to take that, Joanna? Yes. Um, okay. Sure. Okay. Um, one, it takes time and um, it takes a commitment to like not only start those relationships, but to build and um, continue those relationships. One of the struggles I've been having the last two years is that there's been such a need to have direct school support that we are often uh, assigned out to help schools who are having some, uh, that are just need a little extra support based on what's happening in their community. And, um, so that directly will pull me out of meetings, out of opportunities, out of um, ways to build those uh, communications. Slowly been advocating with my counterparts and my supervisors that we can't lose those uh, connections, that we really need to have those in place in order to maintain those relationships. So we know what's new, what's current, what's happening. So. Um, it takes a lot of advocacy when you struggle between um, having a person build those relationships and having support in a school that has some direct immediate needs. So I, I don't have a, when I had time before, it was a much easier uh, thing to do to, to maintain those relationships. That's what I'll say. Uh, I struggle with that a little bit. And Joanna knows that we, we talk about it often. Um, yeah that it's just as important to make sure that those basic needs and those supports are there versus um, um, walking in a school, trying to to support what's needed and happen in the building. But um, I, go ahead. I was gonna say, I think from a school-based perspective, um, we did a lot with community partnerships and it was just being real. Like I'm a really real person and you know, that's how I tend to lean on relationships. Like, I'm sorry, I haven't responded to your email in seven days, but we just have a lot going on. Um, and also like inviting those people in and being a part of our community. Um, so they can see, they can see what the struggle is, or they can feel like how much we care, but um, also acknowledging that a lot of things are thrown at school people. Um, and it's, it's a management, right? Like we, and I think appreciation, right? Um, I think about our school partner, this at a school that I had previously, um, it was really a give and take in appreciation. They would, they were amazing and we were so appreciative. And then they also could come and, you know, help our students, um, and and get to feel all of that love and and the support that our community had. So I think that's huge in in partnerships. Um, also, I think relationships happen. Like I um, was just talking to Jani. I'm gonna space about what um, the program is, but it ended up being like someone that I went to grad school with, right? So <laughs> then it was easy to reach out. Um, it's like it, you know, Madison is small sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, it's not seven degrees of Kevin Bacon in this town. It's, it's <laughs> two degrees of like a couple two. people. Yeah, right. And, exactly. Yeah, and I, just we'll get to Julie here in a second, but know that our organization, this is what we do. We make connections. So if we can help make those connections, whatever we can do for you, you have full disposal there. But uh, Julie. Thanks, Jason. I, I would be curious if you would be willing to identify specifically the partners that you find that you have the closest relationship with or who are most um, engaged or most helpful. I mean, I, I'm just interested to know because we work with literally hundreds of community organizations. And as we consider um, who has what needs and how we support them, knowing who supports you would be really valuable um, understanding. And if that's not comfortable to share in a group that, and in a Zoom that's being recorded, I totally respect that. 
Um, but I, I would be curious, or maybe you could even do it by sector um, mm -hmm. uh, or by topic where, where you find you get the most external support. And, and you can feel free to answer the opposite too, but I thought it would be better to ask the positive question. The positive, yes. <laughs> Jani, I feel like Jani would be more specific. One that I can think of that we are really cultivating a partnership with um, that is mutual is Dane County. So um, my counterpart and I for Dane County Human Services um, are really, really creating a relationship where we can lean on each other. Um, and it also has taken out a lot of the miscommunication, right? Um, so that feels very beneficial to us to be able to like, call and check in. Um, so I guess it's not direct like giving benefits, but the benefit is that the communication is there. And then a lot of like mis mishaps or tensions are relieved, I would say. Danny, can you think of? Yeah, I would tend to say that um, who I uh, connect with and partner with depends on the situation of what I'm um, uh, looking for. So if I'm looking for uh, shelter or housing supports, I may go to um, the Homeless Service Consortium or members within there or the family shelters. If I'm looking for basic needs, I might go to Greater Mass and Resource Center or I might go to JFF or Joining Forces for Families and Community Social Workers. Mm -hmm. I may end up, uh, if I need food resources, I may go to Second Harvest. I am, we have they help us with uh, emergency food bags that we have at hubs all over our uh, at five hubs in the school district where families can come get food at any time or well, or social workers can grab bags for families. Um, it, it really depends on urban triage and urban league are both folks I've reached out to and worked with. It's real specific to what the need is and um, the partnership that we're looking for. I, I would say that I most consistently communicate with our shelters and housing programs. And then anybody, even St. Vincent's is, is a partner that we've worked with multiple times for clothing and furniture and winter gear. And then the Madison Foundation is, is a huge partner for us who helps us with all the school related uh, pieces and connections we can have. They just recently helped us with a lot of winter gear and um, it's, it's um, they're always looking out for our schools to make sure that they have the pieces that they need. You know, it's, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not real specific for one anything, but it just really depends on um, what I'm looking for. A car repair is a local uh, mechanic, right? So yeah. um, it's the challenge is knowing what's available and, and how to reach out to them um, in that moment's notice. Yeah, I also sure. feel like the, dis the district level to the Madison School Foundation, like each school or, or a lot of schools have school partners. So as a school based mm -hmm. person that those were my connections. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just such a savior to know that you could lean on this this um, business and they would help you how you could. And um, I was just always so thankful for that ability. Um, and then also, Jenny, did you say Second Harvest would be another yeah. one? Did mm -hmm. you? Okay. So that those would also be some other ones that I would think through. That's very helpful. Um, and I appreciate you mentioning the adoptive school. I was curious about that. Do you mind if I ask another question? Um, I, thanks. <laughs> I, I'm curious how much you work with the, um, the school nurses and the, you know, yes. the, the whole, the whole health mm -hmm. program um, across the district. There are buddies. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. So um, there's also a lead nurse or a couple of lead nurses actually. And uh, she had just texted me and uh, we, from the district level, we work together all the time because mm -hmm. like I said, the coordinated support of a student services team heavily relies on that communication with nurses too. They're often the first line of um, where kids are going to go when they have a tummy ache. And sometimes tummy aches are not just actually a tummy ache, it can turn into bigger things. Um, as a school-based person, I worked with my nurse probably, well, 
I would say between the psychologist and my nurse, it was kind of us all the time, like daily communication, um, you know, being part of an attendance team because they often, you know, know details about health stuff that that we don't know. Um, they often have connections with families as like the point person. Um, like I was saying before, you know, it takes a village and we can't all inundate families. So yeah, I, I would say for the most part, school social workers are partnering probably most closely with their nurses and the school psychologists. I'm sorry, and I should preface, I have only worked at the elementary level, so um, I don't have much experience at a secondary level, but definitely at an elementary school, those two people were my people. Thank you. And the school nurses are just integral in, in the tech world because they um, recently implemented a program where when new students come into the um, school building, they're doing some initial screenings, like they're doing their uh, vision, their health, their hearing, they're doing a records review, they're looking at immunizations, they're looking at um, uh, medications. So they've just implemented this year this new program to look at every new student as they come in because our students so often miss those health marks because they're so mobile. Um, some of our kids haven't had a vision screening in four years because they moved from school to school to school. So this this new process with them um, came out of a conversation that we were having about the needs of uh, our homeless students and how they're always missing pieces in their health world. So and they took that and they ran with it. And, and I, I'm not sure how it's going, but they were pretty excited about implementing it and putting it in place. So. Thank you. That that's super helpful. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't um, also just either I don't know if this is a question or a mention, but um, for a long time we have partnered with the school nurses and others on the PAC program, Primary Access for Kids. You're from okay. I'm glad you're nodding. I would be really worried <laughs> if you were like, "What's that?" Um, because every school is matched with a primary care clinic. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I'm glad you know that. And kids mm -hmm. can go and it looks like insurance really, and they mm -hmm. can go to primary care. And I, I, I always want to say something about that because if someone doesn't know about it, it's just so awesome and it's free. And sometimes kids don't get matched or, you know, they're, they're, they have, they have barriers um, that, you know, we want to know about. So anyway, I won't go into my rabbit hole on that, but I'm <laughs> glad you're not it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for that. Okay. Other questions about this slide or, or things that we do? All right. Do you want to go on, Jani? So this is the one that I was, I Jani and I talked before and I was like, oh, I don't know, should I put this in there? Should I not? Um, because I thought you might want to know more specifics about programs. Um, but I, when I was trying to think about how we support our most vulnerable students or what we do, I kept like just spinning and spinning um, and I couldn't quite put my finger on it. But what I landed on is every situation is different, right? Um, so there could be slight details like I'm not ever going to do the same thing with one family that I do with the other or one sibling that I do with the other. Um, so I was trying to think through like how I kind of like triage or how I kind of think through um, supporting our most vulnerable families. Um, and Jani has a story from this morning that, that like, you know, um, she had a a, a very angry parent or grandparent, um, and she just kind of we had to work through it, right? So I think the things that what I would say as we coach brand new social workers um, that I always relied on on a day to day basis and supporting our most vulnerable students and their families is knowing the students and creating a connection with their caregivers. By far, you know, even if they are like having their struggling behaviorally that day, if I have a connection with that family and I can reach out and say it's a trusted relationship, it's going to be much more well received than if I don't know them, them at all or they feel like I am just like some woman who is calling them and, and complaining about their child. Um, and with that, like getting details and and not assuming that you know kind of their story. Um, and that goes exponentially a long way um, with, with supporting students. 
Um, meeting each family without judgment and assuming that they are trying the best they can. Um, so a lot of times, Danny, like this morning, you know, um, that that grandma was not frustrated with you personally. She's frustrated with the situation. And even though it might have come across in a hurtful way or in, you know, um, then just assuming that they're doing the best they can. Um, do what you say and follow through. And this is true for supporting staff as well. Um, even the, like, I don't know anything. I, I don't know everything. Um, but if I say that I'm going to do something, I definitely am going to do it and we'll follow up and make sure because that's how I build that relational trust. And Jenny, feel free to jump into yep. any of these. Um, and that, that goes with like create, creating your village too, right? As a young social worker, I did not know a lot of things, but I did know I could lead on Jannie um, for, um, you know, some of those or, or almost all of those. I feel like I maybe talked to Jannie every single day my first year of being a, school, a new school social worker. Um, but knowing who to ask and getting the answers and then making sure to follow up is something that um, I feel like is really helpful in creating those relationships and creating a trusting relationship that can provide support to families. Um, knowing the laws. Um, I had a, um, a big part of my job for a long time was supporting um, students who receive special education services. Um, so understanding, even at the basic levels, what parents' rights are um, in, for example, special education, so the IEP process, because that is a scary, complicated system, right? Um, so if I, as a social worker, didn't know kind of what parents' rights are, how am I going to be able to support them? Same for like English language learners that have a whole set of um, things that they are available to them. Um, if, if social workers don't understand them, um, then they're probably going to miss out on some of those. And then TEP law as well, which Jannie is like the master of McKinney Vento. And I would add in there that even even though I, I might know TEP, I, I don't always know ELL or I don't mm -hmm. know IEP. So even even those of us who have that title, maybe for that that area, um, reaching out and networking with each other is, is so important. Um, you know, in, with our newcomers, what's the difference between an immigrant, a refugee, a newcomer? I mean, what are all those different things and what supports come with them and how to figure those all out and figuring out um, what rights they have all together? It's, it can be pretty complicated. And if it's complicated for us, I can imagine what it's like for the families who are experiencing those situations. Yeah, for sure. Um. Skip the ego. This is when I was like, um, there have been times that I have worked really hard with a family and something hurts that relationship and they no longer want to work with me. Um, and I think that's really true of a lot of social workers. Um, so skipping the ego, like it's not about me. I want to make sure then you're still getting the services that I could provide through somebody else. Um, so that creates the, the need for a relational trust and just support throughout your team, your school team, your district team. Um, but it's not personal, right? Like I, um, I, I, and that took me a few years to not be hurt by those conversations. Um, but I finally, at some point midway in my career clicked that, nope, this is not about me. This is not about me. And then this is about how we support those students and their families. Um, and then creating the village. I know I've said that a lot. It is so exponentially important to be able to have people around you to tap out when you are just at the end of knowing what you can do to to say, I just, you know, I, I need help. Um, oh, thank you, Mary, for putting that in the chat. <laughs> I forget. Um, yes. So she just put in IEP, Individualized Education Program, ELLs, or English Language Learners. And I can't remember what the last one was. But Yes. And then um, even being the advocate when it's hard, even though, you know, you might not agree, um, we are in service of our families. They are our clients. And yeah, that's how we support throughout the day. So I hope that was like somewhat like in light of what we do throughout the day. Um, and if there are other questions. Oh, Jenny, you have your slides, don't you? Yeah, I, you know, I sort of integrated in with what you were doing, where we're going. This is just specific about TEP and what we do and the different pieces that we 
uh, kind of pull in. Um, I, I think uh, one of the things to point out is that we do not provide shelter and we do not provide housing. We are an education program. So there's some confusion about that at times that, you know, families will call and say, I need a place to stay tonight. What we can do is coordinate with our community partners about shelter and about resources, but we don't actually provide evening shelter or emergency shelter and we don't um, do housing navigation. But that's why those um, community partnerships are so important because we refer and coordinate and connect all the time. So, um, and in the world of homelessness, that's a whole nother session just to talk about what that means for students and families and kids. Um, but we really wanted to focus on the work that we do as um, partners and social workers in the schools um, today. Um, it is a federal law, I will say that. So we are mandated to implement this law. It's a law that is written for families and students. It's not written for school districts. School districts implement it, but the law is actually for our families to make sure that they have rights and resources available for them in the world of education. And then um, we're just really open for some questions. I know we're at 8.54, so. Um, <laughs> we, I think we got, yes, thank you. Thank you for the fantastic presentation. And most importantly, thank you for the work that you all do every day. You are crucial links uh, in our system. So thank you. We really do appreciate it. Uh, Peggy, we'll start with Peggy. Great presentation. I, I I cannot imagine the job you do. I'm overwhelmed just reading it on a slide. Um, so thank you to your to you and your teams for all that you do. We work. Um, DMI works really closely with MPD, um, and we've had some presentations um, from them. You know, regarding a, a, an increase, and this was of a couple months ago. So I'm assuming it's similar now, but an increase of families living in cars, um, school age children in in the cars. <laughs> Um, we, what we didn't talk about, though, is, you know, they they find these uh, and try and try and house them, et cetera. How does that child living in a car when that car is mobile can go anywhere? How do you get that child to school? How does that process work? That's a great question. So um, every school, every program has a point of contact. Almost always that's the school social worker or the program social worker. That person um, has, uh, we have a transportation app where they can have a conversation with the family and we will set up a ride, uh, gas cards, a ride, a school bus route, a bus tickets, whatever it needs to do to continue getting that student to school. So it doesn't matter if they're in their car or if they're on someone's couch or they're in a nearby city, um, it's some prairie, Mount Hora, someplace, we will get that student to school as soon as we can and uh, give them a ride in and a ride out. So transportation is part of the McKinney Vento law. We are mandated by the law to make sure those kids are accessing school. It happens almost always through the school social worker. And um, and then we jump in and help coordinate and problem solve when, when uh, needed. I think from a building-based perspective too, I know I said a lot about relationships, but that is usually the text I get at 1030 at night. Like, <laughs> hey, we're staying in our car tonight. Like, I, you know, so then my social work brain goes into like, First of all, how are we going to get you there? Second of all, making sure that you have clean clothes so you're not embarrassed walking into your fourth grade classroom. Um, are we eating? What's the breakfast situation? Like those Im immediate needs. So we get them mm -hmm. to school. And then throughout that day, it's connecting with Janie, connecting with homeless shelters, um, just to see like how we can then alleviate that situation. So those are like when you said that, that's what my brain went through is like, how do we first get them there, support them to make sure that they feel included and then you know, solving, helping problem solve around the bigger problem. There's always the the conversation about safety too. Are you yeah. safe? Yeah. Are you in a safe place? Um, do we need to get you some support, some help? We have outreach programs that we can send out to meet with them and connect with them if they're out in their vehicles. So oh, yeah, um, we have connections to all those too. So that's another part. Follow-up question from that is something that Jenny, I know you've been, you've been a zealous advocate for and really raising awareness on is the, the issue of doubling up. Mm -hmm. uh, and how many families are doubled up with friends, 
uh, with whoever, right, in the community um, that may not apparently look like they're experiencing homelessness, but certainly are. You know, Janet, can you speak to that and the levels you're seeing at MMSD and, and the programs that you're really trying to push forward with this new position to try to help uh, as much as we can with with kids that are and families that are doubled up? Yeah, doubled up is a is a um, a type of homelessness where uh, you can end up there for the exact same reason that you end up in shelter. You could be evicted, you could be kicked out, could be domestic violence, could be a job loss, could be a move, it, it, all those reasons. So the same reasons you might end up in a family shelter, you may end up at a friend's home on their couch or in their living room or on the floor. Uh, unfortunately, what happens in our our federal system is that HUD, Housing and Urban Development, um, prioritizes uh, individuals who are unhoused uh, or in shelters. So the funding and the supports that happen for those populations are where the priority for funding goes. 80% of our families and youth, and actually probably higher than that, I haven't looked recently, are doubled up, which means they don't always have access well, they don't have access to the housing programs or the case management supports because you're not prioritized as um, the most vulnerable because you're not on the street or in a shelter. And I would say that on the street or out in the weather, those are very vulnerable populations and desperately need our support. But I have a hard time when I have a family in shelter compared to a family that's doubled up saying that the family in shelter is more vulnerable than the family that's doubled up. My doubled up families don't have a place to store their stuff. They don't know that they can be there every night. They don't have a place to park their car. They don't have access to food. They don't have access to um, housing navigation or resources. So when you're comparing families who are in shelter, and I have to speak to families because that's what I know best. Um, this there's a whole world of single homelessness that is 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 out there, but it's I know families best. Um, the vulnerability of my and safety of my families who are doubled up is much higher than the vulnerability of the families that I have that are in shelter. So uh, we've advocated. We have a doubled up committee now. We become a community of the HSE. We're no longer a work group who advocated for a position in the district. Uh, county to um, really focus on the needs of our doubled up populations, including all populations, singles, families, youth, and um, making sure that they are not forgotten in the world of our community when it comes to homeless populations. Well, you know, I got to be very clear, you know, Jenny was at the forefront of that zealously, again, advocating for that position. Um, and I'm hoping that you know, there's more resources that are provided. I just want to say a huge, huge thank you to all of you, uh, for both of you, and then, of course, Laura couldn't make it, uh, for all the work that you do day to day to, to make sure every student has the resources they need to succeed. I want to say a big thanks to our friends at the Mass Public Schools Foundation as well. You know, Angie, Mary, the, the team that are on right now. Thank you, Terry. Everyone, everyone, we just really appreciate what you're doing. Uh, and know that we are here to help. If it's to make connections with other nonprofits, other organizations, whatever that looks like, we, we are certainly here to do that. We've got plenty of community partners that want to help. Uh, we're here. So let us know if we can help. Peggy, any any last word, but certainly thank you from, from us at DMI. Yeah, again, thank you and your passion for what you do. I mean, we're just really humbled by by everything that you do and we're so grateful. Thank you. And thanks to everybody for taking the time to be here. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Have a great Thanks, day, everyone. everyone. Have a great, have a great day. Stay safe.